We're going to get right into it. I have a habit of kind of going on a rant and a ramble, and uh, hopefully we'll be all set so we can all lead after this. So, my name is Adam Fight. I'm the Director of Sports Performance for Reach Your Potential Training. It is a private sector facility located right off the Jersey Shore, 105 off the Garden State Parkway, about an hour south of New York City. Okay, our website's listed at the top left, www.igotripped.com for short. And what we do is we pride ourselves to get our kids ready to go to you. If you're a college coach, I remember what it's like to get that incoming freshman that has no idea how to lift, how to train, how to take care of their body, stress management, time management, playing and competing at that next level. I remember the headaches. I remember the preseason testing. Our goal is to prevent that from happening because I know exactly how it feels. Okay? And what we're going to talk and discuss about today is really a lot of reflection. There isn't going to be any X's and O's today, and I apologize for that. There's been a lot of great presenters. Julia Leduski did a great job earlier uh, going from Division I down to the private sector. A lot of questions on programming. Check with her. Uh, Coach Schofield earlier did a great job about the high school athlete and explosive agility and speed. Reach out to these coaches and presenters because they've done a phenomenal job setting the stage and raising the bar for me to communicate today. So before uh, I get on any more, let's continue on. So first what I want to do is I want to talk about, really analyze where we are with the youth. Okay, When I talk about youth, our facility trains primarily high school athletes. We get our college athletes when they come back home for holiday break. And we do have a higher level middle school 7th and 8th grade program. We are not a pre speed school. We're not a velocity sports performance program. We don't take kids at the age of 7 because I am a firm believer in the experiences of where I've been. You've got to have free, uh, free play. You've got to enjoy your childhood. And I'm not going to take money from this overzealous parent, even if it's $100 an hour, if they're nine years old and they want a one-on-one -on -one session. But what I do want you to remember and reflect on are these things right here. Okay? Do we really realize the pressure that our kids go through on a daily basis? Whether you're a college coach, whether you're a personal trainer, whether you're an educator or a high school coach, do you think about that? Coach Mack talked about it earlier, about how you know, we're harping on the little things. The little things are very, very important. But if you don't understand what they went through, the hours at school before they go to your training session, if it is after class, that's going to set you up for failure. Okay? One thing we got to talk about, do you remember what it's like to fit in? Okay? The kids I'm working with, great kids, great athletes, do you remember what it's like to get bullied? Do you remember waking up and being afraid to go to school that day because you're going to get shoved in a locker or the kid's going to spit at you when you're on the bus going to school? I do. Okay? We live in a world where everybody's got to get the latest and greatest iPhone, and when they don't get it from their parents, they get pissed off. And all their buddies are getting the latest and greatest Cam Newton shoes and cleats because that's where they're at. It's tough to fit in. It's tough to fit in at this conference. It was tough for me to leave the NFL and switch a logo from a well-respected seal and organization to a company that nobody had ever heard of. That was tough, and I had to reestablish. I was still the same guy, same coach, same principles, I'm just somewhere else. So fitting in is tough. Okay? What about the pressure to be heard? All right, we talk about social media and the surge and, and making sure that you know, kids are going to tell us everything. Sometimes we say we're, we're adults, right? Facebook's kind of outsourced, it's a little bit older, but how many times do we read a Facebook status and we're like, man, I just wish they could keep it to themselves. If, if you're coaching kids, it's even worse. They tell you everything. Okay? What the bathroom looked like when they were done with it. Uh, if their boyfriend was mad at them, how good they looked in their prom dress, things of that nature. They want people to hear them. And some of it's exaggerated, some of it is kind of over the top. But they're crying for attention. Whether it's negative, whether it's positive, they want people to understand that, hey, they're out here and they're existing. Okay? And the last one is the pressure to win. And if you're a college coach, you know exactly how this is. Okay? There's a pressure to win as a coach to support your family, all right, to support your staff, and we're relying on kids to do that for us. If you're a college coach, that Black Monday is solely determined on how well those kids go out there and perform, especially if you're in big-time football like I was for a number of years. Okay? So the pressure to win, I've got kids, parents paying all this money for private lessons, paying a whole lot of money to us year-round to make sure we can get them ready to get that scholarship. Okay? Those, rice, those prices are going through. The, we have an athlete at Syracuse University. I heard that was going up to 60 grand next year. Can you imagine the pressures that some parents put on their kids? I'm a one-and-a-half-year-old dad right now, and I'm thinking about that long term, opening up a 529. How are we going to take care of this? And I'm sure I'm going to go through that pressure as well. 
So let's talk about what we're, what's our role as coaches. You can be a sports performance coach, you can be a physical preparation specialist, you can be a strength coach. It's all the same, right? Administrators, coaches, parents, what we're gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna get them bigger. All right, we gotta make sure that they're ready to go. We're gonna get them faster. We're gonna get them stronger. We're gonna take care of all the general physical qualities and make sure that they are ready to play the game, okay? I think we've all had to draft a mission statement or a vision statement at some point in our career. As young coaches, as you're getting started, nail that down. What's your goal? And I think most of us, I would say 90% of us, it's gonna be something in the middle of, we're gonna reduce the risk of injury and we're gonna improve sport performance. I had the pleasure and honor of working with Joe Ken, 2014 Professional Strength Coach of the Year, for about four years out of my career when I started out. And I'm sitting in the meeting and he's with the head athletic trainer. And he said, it comes down to two things, guys, protect and produce. And he took a paragraph, a five-page objective analytical statement of why we are strength coaches and why we deserve to get the rates that we deserve of getting in two words. Protect the athlete so they can produce results. That's simple. But that's what we're told we're supposed to do. But what I want to focus on today is, are we missing something, okay? The three areas I want to explore, and I want you to sit back and really reevaluate your program. Coach talked about it earlier about, I used to be a numbers guy. Well, hey, as much as we say we're not numbers people, we have to be if our head coach is down our back saying, I want those numbers up. I want those speed times down. I want those body fats decrease. You got to be a numbers coach. So whatever you're rolling, Division I, Division II, Division III, high school, NAIA, whatever it is, trainer, educator, teacher, student, intern, volunteer, Here's how I look at it, confidence. Do they have the confidence in them to compete on Saturday when they go to Tiger Stadium or the big house or the sold out playoff game? Are you instilling that into them throughout the week? Or are you just dog cussing them because their squat technique sucks, they're not sitting low in the hole, they're catching their cleans like an angry starfish out here, and that's not helping them, okay? Mental strength, let's talk about that. There's a lot of coaches, and especially a lot of sport coaches, I think we've heard it, all right, we've got to get mentally tougher. Your workouts are supposed to challenge them. I had one, my wife, strength conditioning coach, had a coach tell her, you know, they're supposed to fear the weight room. If your athletes fear the weight room, you're not doing your job. We're there to develop, we're there to embrace, we're there to help them, okay? Are we taking care of them? Are we gonna put them in a situation where when the game is on the line, they believe in themselves to succeed? And lastly, Man, we forget about this sometimes. Are they having fun? Okay. Coach brought up a great point earlier, right? When you're in the college sector, it is a job. They're there to play the sport. They look at that as, I just got to lift weights. I got to get this done. You live in different areas of the country, that's what's going to happen. Okay. Even at the NFL and the professional levels, okay, they're there. They're getting paid to play ball. Okay. Have them enjoy the process. I'm very fortunate. I get to work with a very moldable population. They're paying a good amount of money. They've got to have a great environment to do that. And Coach Lewandowski brought up a great point earlier, and I keep going back because we had a lot of great people today. They're going to remember the last five minutes of that training session, okay? If you're going to be running gassers and 110s and doing all your shuttles and alactic power and lactic base and prowler sprints, and you're going to mother F them later on, they're going to remember the last message you say. And if you're working with kids even younger than that, how are you sending them off on their way? Because maybe they got a big tournament the next day. Maybe they got SAT prep. What are we doing to set them up for success? So I'm going to ask you, is there a difference between training a 15-year-old JV baseball player and a Heisman candidate? No. We can go and talk about triphasic training. We can talk about relative intensity. We can talk about training stress and measurements of loads and linear, non-linear, and conjugate, and concurrent sequencing, and all that great stuff that we're gonna learn about. But the meat and the potatoes of making them and making an impact on their life, that should not change. You shouldn't give a privileged status to a Heisman candidate, and you shouldn't brush off the 15-year-old JV player who's just trying to get to make the varsity squad. And I'm guilty of it early on in my career, especially as I start off in college. I wanted to chase the dream. I wanted to work with the best. I wanted to be a head coach. I was 24 years old. I was the youngest head strength coach in Division I. I didn't have time to deal with the noners. My kids call them NARPs, and I'm sure we work with them. Non-athletic, but they're real people, NARPs, okay? At a point in my career, I don't have time. I'll send you to get my GA will work with you, my intern. And it took a couple years and realized where I was at. No, I gotta change that, okay? Because now those kids, 
they're paying us, but at the same point, I'm a little bit older, I'm a little bit more mature, I'm a family guy now, I've understood, we owe them that. Same thing here, don't brush off a handshake, don't big time somebody, because I've been big time before and I can't stand it. And go up to somebody that you don't know their logo, introduce yourself. Don't just look for the Big 10 and the Big 12 and the SEC. Introduce and step outside your comfort zone. Treat people with value. So, does training change? I don't think so. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, what our mission statement at our facility, it's very simple, okay? What we wanna do, we wanna take care of training. We're gonna provide sports performance training. We wanna enable our athletes to reach their highest potential. Reach your potential training, ripped for short, on and off the field. It's not about getting a better front squat. It's not about adding another chain on chin-ups all the time. It's not about you made all shore media district one champion. I'm going to plaster that all over my website because I'm proud of you. Okay? We have to teach them lessons that are going to carry over to the next step. So how we do that, we're going to pride ourselves on three main things, and this is in our objective statement. Okay? Our self-esteem is number one. A parent comes in, they get their athletes assessed. Well, what are you going to work on? Well, straight up, we got their self-esteem's got to improve. He came in right now. I saw you yelling at him, kind of pushing him forward, writing down notes because I knew you wanted to talk to me, Dad. And we've dealt with that. And that's something as a college coach we didn't have to deal with. Parents send their kids off. You don't have to hear about them until homecoming. High school level, middle school, college kids come on break. They want to know. Your self-esteem is going to go through the roof when you're done training with us. Okay? We're going to make you mentally stronger. I didn't say mentally tougher. And you can talk to Pat Ivey at Mizzou about that. He did a great presentation on talking about what really is mental toughness, okay? We want our kids to have the ability to succeed in an adverse situation. Then the last part, I tell them all the time, it's physical dominance, man. This is the bigger, faster, stronger. This is everything that we talked about earlier. Anybody can do that, all right? We're, we face an epidemic with this CrossFit thing, and this is a personal opinion of mine, okay? But some of our athletes are coming to us saying, you know, the workout wasn't hard enough. This guy's going to this place and he was puking. Oh my God, I couldn't feel anything for 24 hours. And we know as professionals that it's a long-term athletic development model. Anybody can make somebody puke. Anybody can make anybody bigger, stronger, faster, more resilient. But are we taking care of the first two things? Are we looking long-term? Are we taking care of the things that really, really matter in the long-term scheme of the whole process? I want you to reflect on that. And really think about it. When you look at your program, before you read the latest and greatest article on elite fitness or you go to this powerlifting meet or you, know, you want to throw in some strongman training, does it have a purpose? And can we validate and where does it fit into our program? Because what it comes down to, the lessons learned in training should be the lessons learned in life. One of the reasons why I did leave the NFL was because I felt I could not have the impact on athletes I wanted to at this time in my career. Whether I was there too early, whether I was not mature enough, whether I wanted more, this resonated with me, and I tell this to everybody. Okay? When a kid gives up on a heavy single on a squat, to me that is no different than when the game is on the line, you don't hold that block. That's coaches counting on you. When your toes are not behind the line on a shuttle, when you start, that is no different than you turning in a resume for your first job and you have a misspelling. Okay? When you show negative body language with hands on hips, on your knees, or on your head when you're tired, that's no different than when you're sitting in a business meeting looking unengaged and you don't want to be there. We make our kids accountable for those because we want to tie in everything we do. They don't have to understand the physiological aspects of squatting and cleaning and jumping and contrast work. But what we try to do, especially at this level and where they are in their development, is understand why we're doing that is understand why when you didn't face the wall on the right side in the sprints, we're going to do two burpees. And we're going to teach them that, hey, listen, you've got to strain through that last rep. If you're an older advanced athlete taking care of business, it's going to be tough. Because in the last couple minutes, if there's open time on that soccer game and you don't know how much time there's left, I, especially, and this is a side note, I hate it when kids ask me how many more we're doing. Hate it. And then I, did, I stopped doing that when I was at Eastern Michigan. I just stopped telling them. We're going to run. Because guess what? You're going to have to play until you win. And if you don't win, you're going to give it everything you got. Because it's easy to say, one more, only got two more. So you're going to tell me you're only going to give it just enough to get through. We've got to teach them to be strong individuals. So what we're going to focus on, this, this worked out really great. I want to thank my intern from the fall, Gabby Goodrow, 
She's an All-American runner at Springfield College, my alma mater. And what we do with our intern curriculum is we have them read two books during their 12-week semester. Has nothing to do with strength conditioning, okay? It was a book on life and a book on leadership. And we give them a list and we say, you know, these are things, this is our bookshelf, you can explore. And Gabby picked out, which was very coincidental, Coach Joe Ehrman, who's actually the keynote speaker. And this kind of sets a foundation, and I really hope you guys get there. His Inside Out Coaching, top three books I have ever read on coaching it has nothing to do with X's and O's. The other two are Make the Big Time Where You Are by Frosty Westering and Wooden by John Wooden. Okay, and this is what we want to talk about. And this is kind of in the earlier part of his book is what do athletes need at this level? Number one, okay, they need somebody to believe in them. They need coaches. They need us. They're looking to us because they might be getting cussed out by mom and dad. Their coach probably doesn't like them very much. They come to sports performance professionals to get built back up, some of them. That's our role. They need a structured belief system. They don't want chores. We're not going to give them an allowance. But you know what? It's OK to give them expectations and hold them high to those regards. And lastly, which I think is the most important, is they need a support, family, system, community. Okay? We're not a big box gym. But think about it as a college coach. Are they going there to just train at 6 AM because that's what they have to do? All right. Are you involving, are you doing teamwork, are you doing team camaraderie, are you doing things of that nature where it's getting them ready and focused and they love being there? A great shout out to a, a very good friend of mine, Donnell Boucher at the Citadel. Donnell and I go way back to high school. We went to the Citadel GAs. He's now the assistant athletic director there. He's got kids coming in and the Citadel is a whole other aspect of military institution and the way of life. Kids are coming in and cleaning for free. Kids are flat. They're doing all this awesome stuff. You see it all on their Facebook. I said, man, people want to be there. When they get done with orders and they got nothing to do, they go to the weight room just to hang out because they love being there. Are your athletes doing that? Or are they getting in and out and say, I can't, I just, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you next week. Or, you know what, it's discretionary period. I'm not coming in. Because if your kids aren't coming in during discretionary period, something's wrong. So this is what we're going to talk about. What do our athletes need? So I'm going to ask you, what do you think the role of a coach is? We're all here, it's a coaches conference. What do you think your role is as a coaching professional? Okay, is it to belittle somebody? To make them feel worthless? Make them feel bad about themselves because they didn't get that last rep? All right, or is it believing in them? Pushing them beyond what you think they never could be capable of and understanding you've got one more. You can do it. We're right behind you. This is part of a team. Or you're gonna go the other way and just make them feel bad. Kids late, let them know, explain to it why the important is what it is. We make the bad decision, we've all made bad decisions, some of us still make more than others, but you gotta get better at them. Are we there to criticize them or construct them in a positive manner? Listen, your squat is not very good right now. I need you to focus on this right now. We'll take care of the rest of the stuff as we continue to go forward, okay? That's what we need to do. Instead of saying, that guy, he's not, he can't throw him on the leg press. We've all done it. Okay? Now, there reaches a certain point. Again, we're going to get into that whole thing later. Some athletes can do it. Some athletes can't. But instead of just giving up on them and throwing them in the towel, are you constructing? Are you giving them positive feedback? Are you building them up or are you going to break them down? And are you going to scream at them? Or are you there to soothe their pains if something happens? Especially if you're working with a youth population like I am. Okay? Kids don't pay money to get yelled at. They pay money to get better. And sometimes to get better, you need to hear things you don't want to hear that day. And I'm fully okay with that. We run our program like any other Division I, II, III, or high-level strength conditioning program. I believe in these things wholeheartedly, and that's why it's a part of our program. We're there to build, but we're also letting them know you've got to take care of your responsibilities. Because that's what your coach is going to want. That's what your parents are probably expecting. And when you get to that college level, you're going to send me a nice thank you card and saying, you were right. I understand it now. And I'm the demo athlete for every lift. And I'm only a freshman. And the girls hate me on the team because I can dumbbell snatch 35 pounds and they're all grabbing 17s. That's what happens. Build them up. OK. So what Coach also talks about, too, again, some self-reflection. In his book, and hopefully he'll talk a lot more about it this tonight, All right, he goes into detail and talks about five coaches. Okay, five types of, you can call them coaches, you can call them personalities, 
You can call them just, hey, maybe that switch flipped on and you're this guy or that lady at one point in your career. It could be that morning. You can be a dictator in the morning and then we'll get into another type of coach later on. It can be completely different. What I've learned as a professional in this field is if you don't take care of home, that's going to carry over. And if you're a young coach, if things aren't good on the home front with your managers and associate heads and your head coaches or your head ball coach, you're going to know about it. So learn right off the bat. You've got to take care of you and your family first because that's always going to carry over to work. Everybody talks about, well, he doesn't understand the demands, the grind. Listen, man, we're going to spend more time at work, but that family's number one. That's my anchor. That's going to take care of work because I'm going to spend a lot of time at work. I've got to take care of my family. So dictators, okay? So I want you to ask yourself, do you know somebody? Have you worked for somebody? Does this kind of show up once in a while? All right? The dictator, it's the my way or the highway. You're going to do it this way because that's how we do it here. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. If you don't like it, go ask coach for your transfer letter. This is how we do things here. Okay? We've got the bullies in there. I challenge you. I dare you to show up late. I'm going to make you hurt so bad freshman Friday morning, you ain't never going to want to do that again. Okay? Or is there the narcissist? Okay? Are you the guy that takes, or, or, excuse me, are you the male or female coach that takes the credit when your team wins the big Super Bowl of that division if you're in the high school level, that playoff win in the college, or maybe that bowl bid, and you're up there on Facebook and Twitter saying, thanks, yeah, it was a great you know, grind, I did everything I could. Remember why you're doing it. That's just an extra bonus at the side. A little bowl bonus. Maybe you get a nice leather suitcase with the embroidery of your decal. That's great. They didn't win because of just you. You weren't the number one reason why your team went from 2-10 and 10 to 10-2. and two. We've got to remember as professionals, we're a very small piece of the puzzle. You've got your academic support supervisors. Okay? And I firmly believe, I hope, with your strength, conditioning, profession, your role at your institution is so great, you should have an athletic director title. Because there are two people that deal with them the most are the academics and the athletics, the strength coach. Okay? But you've got to remember, there's everybody involved. There's the teachers, there's the coaches, the trainers, the team chaplain. Everybody has an integral process in your success. Ask yourself, have you ever been a saint? Okay? Did you ever take that personality where... You know, kind of maybe you felt like you had to save everybody. Like they gave you a mission. You say, I, I inherited a program that didn't win a game. And when I started off as a head coach, I, I was a little bit of a saint. I kind of I wanted to make sure that the players bought into me. I wanted to make sure that they understood I cared about them. And I felt like I had to change the culture, and it was my responsibility. And then I drove myself into such a rut and getting so stressed because we still kept losing. Our kids still kept getting hurt. And it took me a long time after that to realize you can't do it all. You shouldn't put it on your shoulders. You've got to lean on to others. You've got to make sure that other people can share that load. Okay? And, and don't do it just at home. Because your wife or husband, they've got enough. So, try not to save the world. Okay? Don't be a player's coach. Don't, like the, don't, have the, don't do things just to have the kids like you. They have to respect you. They'll like you when they realize, after they respect you, what you were doing for them is what they needed. Or have you ever been a misfit? Have you ever coached with a misfit? All right. I see a lot of this at my level. We've got a lot of parents. Yeah, I'm coaching youth soccer. No idea what I'm doing. Just throw the balls out. My, my Little League baseball coach was like that. He was a drunk. He'd come on, he put his hat over, he'd sit at third base, put the bat bag out. His son would run the practice. Great team because we learned how to coach ourselves. Okay. We got some coaches. Are you here? because you want to be a strength coach, because you understand what the impact that you can have on the athletes, or you're here because it seemed like a good idea and you want to be on the sidelines. You want to run out on the tunnel on Saturday or Sunday. All right? You want to be on ESPN. You want to take a snapshot and put it on Instagram when they caught your face at the very moment when your star running back ran it for 100 yards. Okay? You got to understand why you're doing this. That's first and foremost. So transactional coaches are transactional personalities. These are things that are going to happen in day-to-day -day life. Could happen interday. It happened in the morning. You had a great session in the morning, then your team's coming in the afternoon or something happened. We gotta remember, we gotta keep things into perspective. Okay? So next, what's the other side? So this is what he calls transformational coaches. And you, you know those people right up there. I think it's very fitting. Tony Dungy is probably one of the most famous as well as John Wooden. Okay? These are the guys that it's not about them. It's about the team. 
It's about everything else. They understood why and what it took. Tony Dungy, if you read any of his books, Quiet Strength and a few others, you know, he had Herman over there to be his bad cop. People respected Coach Dungy. He had other people. He was himself. He wasn't a yell. He wasn't a shouter. The guys respected him. They did well, but he had other people. He had other people to act transactional for him. So try not to be somebody you're not. When I took a head job, my head football coach knew I wasn't a mother effer. I wasn't going to dog cuss him. I was going to let him know how I felt, but other people in that department took care. If they felt that's what they needed, they took care of that. So they're other-centered. It's about them, not me. That's what you have to remember. Okay? Coming to this conference, it's about your department. It's about the other people you work with. It's about how can I make my program, my kids better. It's not about let's go out to eat, let's hang out, let's skip all the talks because the school gave me a bunch of per diem and let's have a good time. Act other-centered today and the rest of the weekend. They're authentic. They do as they say as well as I do. Coach talked about it earlier. It's about having character. It's doing the right thing at the right time all the time even when nobody's looking. You're the same person today. You're going to be the same person tomorrow. When you go home to your wife and kids, you're the same person there. They're servant leaders. They're going to act with humility. They're going to be humble. I am beyond humbled right now. This crowd showed up. Beyond humbled. And if there's anything I can do after this presentation to help and continue to pay it forward, I will be glad to. That's what it's about. It's about understanding where you've been, where you are now, and then where you could be, but all in respect to where it is happening right now. And they're empathic, all right? They understand and appreciate the emotions and feelings of players. You're not a guidance counselor. You're not a therapist. But if you're going to cuss a guy out because he was late, you're going to have to understand, I was late, coach, because I'm behind. I'm working overtime at Home Depot third shift because my sister's got a bad illness and I'm trying to help my mom with the bills. And that happens a lot with us, and I'm sure, I'm sure all of you have dealt with that. You kind of jump somebody real quick. You, don't, you, don't, you think on instinct, and then you realize something bad happened. And then you got to be like, sorry about that, man. I just, you know. And we tell our kids all the time, listen, your girlfriend's going to break up with you. You're going to lose your prom date. Your prom dress isn't going to fit, you know, before you come in. I mean, if, you're, if it ain't going to work that day, you let us know. And what we ask our kids, you're not going to be 100% every day. Not one coach, not one athlete, not one dad or mom is 100% of their potential every day. But what we ask them is whatever percent you have, if you've got 80% in that tank, if your fuel gauge is at 80% and that's as much as you got that day, we want 100% of that. Give me everything you've got, whatever you're capable of. Okay, so those are the two types of coaches or personalities we have to ask ourselves. Which one are you? Do we have aspects of that? Do we find slivers of that if we get upset? If things aren't, aren't okay in the home front? All right, if the boss throws you a bunch of paper, if you're a young coach and you're getting frustrated because you're not getting any jobs, are you taking that on your students because you're a GA and you're getting this master's degree from this great school? Now you're getting all mad? It's a grind. You got to know a lot of people. You got to do a lot of great things and people got to know you. Don't punish the kids. It's not their fault. So let's make sure we take care of that. Going into belief systems. A couple things we want to make sure, hopefully, you can look into. All right, Your program, whether you're a head coach, assistant coach, GA, intern, director, educator, do you have guidelines and expectations for your program? Is that something you go with them over the team meeting? It'd rather be overkill than, hey, you're going to punish a guy because he had his earrings and he didn't tape them at some schools I've worked at. Well, is that listed? Do they understand that? Are you holding them to any standards? Okay. Is it okay to show up late? Is it okay to talk back to your coach? Is it okay to put your hands on your hips? Is it okay to not give your card to your coach on the last set? You got to have standards. Kids want standards. As much as we think like rules, remember being kids, okay? They, they want, you, you have to have structure. Imagine if this session wasn't structured out. We didn't get any guidebooks. We didn't get any handouts. Would we really get a lot of stuff done? How nice was it that we could just go to our phone, there's my schedule, pin it, tack it, here I'm going here, I'm moving this, this. Structure is what keeps everything going. It's smooth, it's flowing, okay? And when you have those standards and structures, are we teaching them the value of those? Do they understand why it's important to show up on time? Do they understand why it's important to give it everything you got when you feel like you've got nothing left? It's on us to make sure that they do if you take a lot of pride in that position. Because I firmly believe we are here more than weights and plates. There is a lot more value that we can add to our student athletes than just get them bigger, faster, stronger. And I could be wrong, and maybe that's your position at your school or institution, 
just get them in and get them out. And I worked for a coach like that, and that was one of the reasons why I also left another institution. Grind them up, chew them up, spit them out, get the next guys through. Let's go. Not me. Couldn't do it. So I had to bite my lip and move on and find something better. Okay, our commandments, our expectations with our, our facility, something that we drafted. This is about a four foot by six foot sign our kids see as soon as they walk in. All right, we talk about our mindset. All right, they have to change their mentality. Okay, they get to train with former NFL Division I Olympic strength conditioning coaches. They have a privilege of doing that. It is not a workout. They don't just show up at Retro Fitness or Workout World and just clock in and clock out. They don't take their college summer home discretionary packet, pay the $5 open gym fee, and do it on their own. Training with us is a privilege. They need to act that. It's just like driving. Parents tell us that all the time. It's a privilege, not a right, and they can take it away. Okay? We talk about preparation. Okay? I think Pat Summit said it best. If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're gone. I can't tell that to a 14-year-old who has no control over transportation. But what I can do is if their parents do sign up for the adult program, then the kids are like, man, you're really, you're really getting on my son about that. He was on me all, Coach Adam got mad at me. I was late. I was running late. Can't do that. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I get it, okay? But if you're a college athlete, you know the expectations. You got to be there on time. I had a mom call me. She said, I'm just, you know, I'm not really, I heard a lot about the ripped experience. And that's, that's, a, that's a highlight video that we're working on to really show what we're, what we're doing over there. And it really came to light, you know, I heard all these great things. I heard about the positive attitudes. I heard about all the fun. I heard about all the results you're getting. And I just, you know, I'm a little disappointed. And as a director, I'm in charge of all that stuff. Customer relations, programming, marketing, everything, you name it, fixing everything up. And then I remembered who it was and I said, well, you know, you brought your daughter in twice this week, 37 minutes late. The program's an hour. How much of an experience are you going to get with 23 minutes left? They didn't warm up. They just come in. They throw the whole flow off. Okay? So having the preparation, having them understand it's important to be there, that's very important. Believe. Okay? They've got to believe in themselves. They've got to believe in us as a staff. Okay? And they've got to believe in the wholehearted. They've got to take care of business. All right? If they can believe in us, then they're going to believe into our program. Then the results will speak for themselves. They'll believe in themselves. Okay? Commitment, we tell them to commit to the process and train in the moment. There's going to be a lot of things going on in their mind, a lot of things. Test scores, getting ready for this camp, this showcase, this clinic. What am I going to do? I'm a junior year lacrosse player. No coaches have contacted me. I've got an algebra test. I've got to do we remember that as college coaches? Okay, especially if you're at an institution like the Citadel where most of those engineering guys are taking 19 to 22 credits. Or if you've got an athlete that's in the physical therapy program or PTA program, and I'm not trying to make excuses, because I firmly believe if you're going to commit to something, you've got to do it. But do we understand the commitment? I'm not saying bend. I'm not saying break. But are we, do we understand what they're going through? Okay, can we relate to them? Attention to detail, okay, we tell them the whole time. Little things lead to big things. You don't score a touchdown because you had a great run. You score a touchdown because you had a great snap because your quarterback saw the field vision, because he maybe changed the audible, you had a great offensive line to block, the other guy went downfield, he took the extra effort to block somebody at the third level, and then you scored. That one little thing at a time is a catalyst to keep going and going and going. Parents will sign up for eight, 12 week packages. We usually do it by seasons, okay? If you want results, you gotta be committed. Well, can I just pay for one day at a time? No. Because you're going to come back to me and say, well, we were there for 12 weeks, but I showed up five times. I didn't get the results. Well, you got to be committed. And that's why we have off seasons. And that's why we have, you know, makeup days. That's why we want you to take advantage. Because if you're committed to the process, all right, I want you to take care of that right now. Body language. I brought it up earlier. We don't allow negative body language in our facility. There is no hands on hips. There's no hands on head. All right, there are no hands all over, except you can stand like that, you can stand like that, because when we're running, and Gatorade did a great commercial on that a few months back, the universal sign of defeat was this, and you can hear in the background, because what are you thinking right now? If I'm an offensive lineman and I see a defensive lineman doing that, I got him beat right off the bat, and our kids run, and they run, and they run, and they stand up. So the first day, it's a freebie. Hey, get that bad habit out of you. Psychology will tell you it takes you three weeks to get rid of a bad habit. We give them a day. And every time they do something, hey, two burpees. And I'll show you a picture later. I'm not afraid to hand them out. I had Vinnie Curry in our facility, second round draft pick with the Philadelphia Eagles. 
to do some uh, prep work before the draft, I made him do 28 on his first day. Hey, you're Vinnie Curry, man. You're nobody else right now. You are just as important as my 18-year-old kid who's just trying to make it to a Division III school. You're the same standards as everybody else, okay? In adversity, okay? And that's something we preach big time on because it's not easy. Being a kid these days isn't easy. Being an adult, being a father, being a mom, being a head coach, being a GA intern, none of that is easy, okay? We want them to take chances. We want them to explore. We want them to take risks. You cannot be afraid to fail or you cannot be a fail to be great. And some kids hold themselves back. Ask yourself, do you have an athlete on your team that you see a lot of potential in? And maybe, maybe it's a walk-on. And I, I, I had a heart for walk-ons, man, because I broke my arm my senior year in high school, all offers withdrawn, not like I had a lot. And I pretty much was a preferred walk-on at Springfield College. Head coach took a gamble on a chubby kid from Chickabee, Massachusetts with a snapped humerus. And I had to prove myself, okay? There's going to be kids on your teams that they could be great. Are you developing them? Do you see that? If you've got enough authority figure relationship with the people that make the decisions, if you're a football strength coach, can you go to the head table during your meeting and say, hey, listen, this guy's working his tail off. And I've worked with coaches that just because there are walk-ons, they don't get that extra effort point. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's no good. It has nothing to do with whether you're good or not. It's objective. The guy busted his tail. He gets the extra step. Okay? Don't be afraid to fail, and don't be afraid to be great. Take care of it. So expectations continued on from there with us. Okay? All right, we, we keep our kids accountable on missed lines. Okay? We want them to touch every single line when we run our shuttles. Okay? They understand you're going to hear it a lot. Last set, best set. Okay? If you're going to squat at 88% and you're in our college program and your last set is three to five reps, you're going to go, you're going to make this your last one, you're going to make this your best one. I want that bar moving just as fast as set number one 10 minutes ago. Okay? Keep the accountability there. Make sure they understand that it's not about minute number five, it's not about the first snap, it's not about the first series. It's about what's going to go on in the half and what's going to go on when you've got to go to overtime. And in New Jersey high school, it's, I think it's almost triple overtime now. That's why we don't tell them, Coach, how many are we running? As much as needed to get the effect I'm looking for. And hopefully, they succeed. But then you see them break. They get a little sloppy. They don't want to touch the line. Another two. They face the wrong way. Another two. And then when we got to bring them up, remember, we talked about they're going to remember the last five minutes. But they got to remember, listen, that's why we do it. Okay? The four-quarter program, popularized down south. Okay? Alabama. The four-quarter program, that's a little bit of the piece of the puzzle. They got what it takes to go and continue to go above and beyond. All right. I told you earlier, all right, I got a nice athlete up there underneath one of our walls. She is the current record holder for burpees, hands on hips. She did 48 in one day. One day is 90 minute session. Imagine how many burpees, no, I don't think anybody really truly enjoys burpees, okay? 48 of them. So hey, we made light of it. We took a picture, we put it on Instagram. Congratulations to the new queen of rip, burpees. I got about 159 likes and shares. It was great. Okay, but we want to make sure we are keeping them accountable. We want them to do the right thing, the right time, every time. Okay? We talk about last set, best set. It's a priority, something that I learned when I was an undergrad at Springfield College. Last set, you just don't do it. You got to give it to a coach. You got to make sure they see it. We're going to grade it right off the bat. We keep it very simple because we have a lot of interns that help us out. Okay? You circle it. It's a check mark if the weight was just about right. Then we'll make the changes right away. So we'll have a couple cycles already written in, especially if they're advanced, and we do have some numbers on them, okay? If it was a check minus, the, either the weight was too heavy, the form wasn't really great, we're going to make the change right then and there. Check plus, smoked it, weight was too light, we have time, we'll do another set. If not, we're going to go up a little bit more next week. Think about that when you write your cycles. Just because the kid back squatted 450 at the end of the winter program doesn't mean he's squatting 450 in preseason. And if you're a Division III athlete, you do all your testing in April before May, before you leave for college, then, you, excuse me, you leave for home, you come back in August, and you're going to rep test, don't assume they can do 90% of what they're supposed to do. Because if you're a Division III, you ain't staying on campus. I went home, I worked Home Depot, third shift. Then I had to take classes, chemistry classes, get a nutrition minor. I trained when I could, but I was expected to do what I could, and that's all I could. But the grand scheme of it, though, we do have to understand, they are still kids, okay? They're going to make mistakes. You're going to get a new athlete that doesn't understand what we call the ripped way of life. 
they're going to make mistakes. You're not going to harp on them. You're going to remind them. You're going to remind them. You have to find a way to coach and communicate. And that was something I'd love to talk about, whether it's a blog post or just communicating. There's coaching, and then there's conversation. You can walk down an aisle of a great weight room, 10, 12, 14, 16 squat racks. Get lower, squat, chest up, knees out. But are they listening? Heath Brothers, great book, Switch. Are you getting your message across? Okay, just because you told, and I told them to get their knees, knees out, chest up. I, I told them that. Yeah, but it's not working. How do you make it stick? Another book, Stick, Made to Stick. Is it sticking? So you coach them. Okay, take care of that. Then you got to converse with them. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. All right, so what I'm saying, what does knees out mean? All right, well, that's on me. I didn't tell you that, did I? So when you're coming out of the butt and you converse, you conversate with them. Oh, I got you. There's always time to do that. You don't have to be their buddy buddy. You don't have to have a million coaches there. But if you're coaching and you're screaming cues out and it's not what it is supposed to be, try that. Take them over. Listen, this is what I mean by that. Do you understand that? Okay, good. Let me check your next set. Grab me before you do it and we'll move on. Okay? They're kids. High school, college, middle school, professionals. Everybody's still a kid at heart. Okay? So just tone it down a little bit. But then you have to remind yourself, and this is something from Coach Wooden, okay? If they don't have the time to do it right, when will they have the time to do it over? And I'm a firm, and this is what happens. I get a lot of this with my adolescent boys. And if you're a male in the crowd, you kind of remember what it was. We don't have a lot of adolescent boys in our facility because a lot of the football coaches in the area want to keep their guys there. They're not certified. They have to train at school. Then their parents call us, try and fix all the problems we have, and then we have to do private sessions with them because they're squatting four or 500 pounds, and it's a, it's a good morning. And then they're posting it on YouTube as if, hey, great, this guy, all-star center doing this and that. And then I'm getting yelled at because the kid can't do a front plank, and, and the dad's like, you're holding him back for good reason, sir. So you got to tell them right off the bat, you're, this is not what we want. This is how we do things here. Let's change it, okay? And I want you to fix it right away because you're not going to have another opportunity, and especially if you're at the professional level. Those guys are week to week almost. Something I learned through a couple of the guys I was coaching, if you made it through Wednesday, you were almost pretty much safe. Imagine that. Imagine every Monday you walked into work, and on Wednesday morning, you're just waiting if there was a letter on your desk. And then you do it again. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, get back on Monday. Not there. Tuesday, not there. Wednesday, not there. All right, I made it another week. Have them do it right as soon as possible, as much as possible. Okay, capital versus community. We talk about we're going to get into the family. We're going to close up pretty soon. All right. Do your athletes belong to another big box gym? And if you're a personal trainer, if you're you know, at the high school, okay, or even your college, okay, is it the weight room? Is it the pit? Is it something cool? Is it the dog pound? All right. Are you, are you giving it an identity? Or is it just, I got to go work out. Coach said we got to get him in. Got to squat today. Got to bench. Got to do my cleans. Got to do my split squats. I hate it, but I got to get it done. Okay. Do they feel part of something? Do they really enjoy their time there? Do you have a relationship with them? Do you know about their personal life in a professional manner? And that's a little gray area. And as a college coach, that's obviously a little bit different than where I'm at because I can talk trash about I saw a picture on here or I went to go see them play a game on the weekend. And I can, I can do that. And you've got to take it down to a different level at the college. But do you know about them? Okay. Did you meet their parents at homecoming? All right. Do you remember what it was like when they came on their recruiting visit? Okay. Do they have to train? Do they have to train with you? Or do they want to train? Are they excited to show up at 6 a.m.? Or a 545 blitz session where you got the whole field set up? Okay. Do they want to go in there after practice? Do they want to go in there during discretionary period? We can control that as best as we can by making them feel a part of something special. Okay. What we do at RIP, and these are just a few things, and we'll close up very shortly, okay? To us, it's about a family. We started with seven athletes. My wife and I took a leap of faith. I met with a lot of coaches out there that were saying, it just, it's tough. I don't know how you made the, you know, I don't know how to make the decision. I, I just don't know. I think I'm okay. And I'm just, just go. If it's something you're passionate about, it took me five years, five schools, a professional organization to finally figure out I should have been here the whole time. But if I wasn't, I wouldn't have valued it as much as now. And the great thing about being in the private sector and as a former college and professional level strength coach, I can tell you is you can make an impact. You have that power, okay? 
Couple of things to think about. We give a $5 t-shirt every time somebody signs up. You sign up for the fall, if you're a lacrosse or baseball player or basketball, you sign up for the winter if you just got done with the fall sport, you sign up for the spring if you just got done with your winter sport, and the summer is the whole entire entity. Every time you sign up, you get a t-shirt. So if you want to talk about advertising, take your money out of print and give them a $5 t-shirt with your logo on. That is free advertising. Or you mark up your program five extra dollars. But to them, it's about a belonging. They belong. We have kids coming in after they get assessed. Do I get my t-shirt? Do I get it? <laughs> Settle down. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll give it to you. Okay, because we just don't hand it out to everybody. And then you see it at the conferences. You see it at the clinics and showcases. You can't go around anywhere in Monmouth County, New Jersey without seeing it somewhere. But to them, it's about belonging. I belong to something. These guys and ladies, these coaches, they're coming to see me out and play. We went to a middle school play. One of our athletes was Ursula and the Little Mermaid. You know how much that meant to that family? And that was a great idea for my wife and I to get out and have a date. Go to a middle school play. Let's check out the Little Mermaid, OK? Social media, we talk about community there. You'll see trending, if you follow us at I Got Ripped, OK? Hashtag Rip Nation, you'll see that. Get Ripped, those are, kind of, those are our rally cries. Kids tag that. You've got to learn how to use social media. And Donnell Boucher is a great example. I'm bringing him up a lot, but he had this thing figured out five years ago, all right, when I was talking about, no, we can't do that. That's, that's, un, that's unprofessional. You've got to win games. Don't want to be posting that stuff unless you're winning games. Nobody cares unless you're winning games. I remember talking with Caitlin Quinn, who was just named the Assistant Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year at Florida State. Went down to visit her a few years ago, and her, her athletes are texting her. I can't make the workout. I'm like, what are you doing? My athletes call me or they email me. Text, that's unprofessional. It's changed. Follow them on Twitter. Follow them on Instagram. If you have updates, make sure they understand that, okay? Tweet at them. If there's something, new, congratulations to so-and-so, at so-and-so, at so-and-so. Won the competition of the week because that's viral. They see that. They star it. They retweet it. And then all of a sudden, 15 more kids either know about your place or they know that, hey, man, this kid is kicking some tail at this gym. Then that makes them feel better. Their identity is better. Their legacy is better. They feel more confident. Nicknames. Did you guys have a nickname growing up? Did you ever have an uncle? I had a favorite uncle. He called me Skizik. I guess it was Polish for alfalfa. I didn't remember really looked it up, but that was him. It wasn't Adam. Hey, Skizik. That's it. That because that takes the time. That he named me. He's gonna remember me. I give as many nicknames as I can to my kids. Hitman, Punisher, Ballerina, Mermaid, depending on who they are. But when I see them. They light up because they know Coach Adam took the time. He's going to remember me, okay? And maybe you have that. But think about you. Did you have a favorite uncle? Did you have a Little League coach? Because you made an impact on your coach if they took the time to think of a nickname for you. That's about identity. In our facility, you'll see on the bottom right right there, okay, for every athlete that trains with us and signs an NLI, they have to do a minimum of two seasons. So I'm not a facility that says, oh, I trained this guy and he's going to Notre Dame. No. They've got to do two complete seasons with us, preferred three. They sign an NLI during their active season with us. We split the cost of a fat head, which is $100 with their family. We put their family name on the plaque located in the front of the facility. When you walk into our facility, you've got all these schools lined up. Mostly it's Division I. If it's a Division II or Division III school, I contact the sports information director, explain to him who I am, what I want to do, can I have the rights to get the high definition logo. I bring it to Fathead, we get it, we make it, it's all set. That's a legacy, because that kid's going to come to that gym all the time and saying, I left my print on that program. Okay? Are you doing it with your staff as coaches? Okay? Do you have, are you recycling so many coaches you have such a great program? Are you putting baseball flags up there? Are you putting t-shirts up there? Are you making a stamp on the program and letting people know, hey, these people come here as GAs and interns, and then they go out to these places right here. We're, pu we're pushing kids out. This is great. And they left an impact on that program. Okay, and I talked earlier about the social events. You're acknowledging them not only as athletes, but as people and individuals. We do our very best. We have our staff work on, hey, these are the teams that we work with. These are the athletes. Let's try and sync them up. Is Ocean Township going to play Wall High School? We have six athletes on each team. Can we make it, get there? Are they playing on the weekend? We coach all day right after school, all the way up until 9 o'clock, and our weekends are reserved. Go to as many games as we can. Let them know, great job, nice job. Talk to them on Monday and Tuesday. College coaches, you have it a little bit easier. You have to go there, all right? Hopefully you don't get stuck at practice like I had to all the time.
but you get to enjoy that game and take care of that. All right? And follow them and make sure you're taking care of the big picture. Finishing up, it's about family, a couple things we've done, all right? Some outside the box things. All right, we do, we work with a local high school. We pinned up, we call it the Battle of the Blue Devils. We work with their field hockey and soccer team. They train with us on both uh, during the summer on different days. We pinned them up, we made them do a costume contest. This summer we did superheroes and villains. We gave prizes out for all that. Who could they, best costume. We did, you know, every team competition you see on YouTube and Strength Performance Network, we did. You can do that at that level if you organize it right, okay? The first year, right before my son was born, we did Ripped Olympics. It was going on right during the opening ceremony. So we pinned the soccer team. We split them up into countries. They made costumes for that as well. We've done on the conditioning days, we went off the script. If we train during the Easter break, all right, I'm going to throw out a bunch of Easter eggs. You pick, you go. That's what you got. Could be a 200 burpees as a team. Could be five 300-yard shuttles between 10 people or two people. You know, it's getting outside the box, okay? Costume competitions, uh, battles. Get creative with your teams. Don't get sucked into the whole, it's got to be a strongman circuit. Add some other elements to that. Halloween lifts, that was something very popular we did a lot sometimes in college. Bring the freshman in on a red shirt freshman Friday and have them dress up. Cut the sleeves off. That's going to go a long way in that long season, especially as a red shirt. Okay? So, finishing up. When you were younger, did you have a coach that made a big difference in your life? Did you have somebody that shaped you, that modeled you? that gave you an identity and a nickname, that really sought to take you in? Did you have somebody that believed in you? Or did you have somebody that just pushed you to the side? All right? Was it your dad who coached you and didn't parent you? And a lot of coaches have done that, and a lot of coaches have told me not to do that to my son. So when you were a kid, did anybody make a difference, positive or negative, in your life? And what can you do to be modeled after them or what can you do to change that so that doesn't happen again? I'll be around all weekend. Thank you.